What's up, guys? I'm back, and I want to tell you something. This particular story that we're dealing with, it's a funny thing how domestic violence plays into paranormal encounters. Not just cryptid encounters, but paranormal encounters in general. There's a direct correlation to domestic violence in these type of encounters. In this case, I'm not so sure that this is a dog man, even though what he's described sounds to me like a damn dog man. I'm just not sure. But nonetheless, I decided to produce the story so you guys can take a listen to it and you tell me what you think. I'm not sure what this was. That's why you don't see me defining it as a dogman encounter. There are similarities to dogman encounters with what this guy is experiencing, but I'm not sure. And I wanted to disclose that to you up front. I'm hoping you guys are having a phenomenal, wonderful day. Also, within the next week or so, we're going to be launching the Men of Steel prayer group. It's a men's only prayer group called the Men of Steel's prayer group. And you will be welcome to. What is this? You'll be welcome to join into this group. I'll be putting a link to the website in the description below. It's called the Men of Steel prayer group. The website is strongmenpraying.com. Strongmenpraying.com. There'll be Wednesday Bible studies. And then there'll be a special session for influencers. In the cryptid field. So if you are an influencer in a cryptid field and you want to understand the spiritual warfare that you go through, being a member of this field and being an influencer in this field, then it would be good. I'm telling you, it would behoove you to join this group so you can find out about some of the things that you need to do to defend you and your family. All right, ladies and gentlemen, one and only James Williams, Dalt Waters, I'm out of here. Enjoy the show. Back now with a disturbing rise during the pandemic. As many people stay home to stay safe, that can be the worst place to be for victims of domestic violence. Here's Kate Snow. Like your heart has just, someone took a huge knife and just kept carving your heart out. The pain is still so raw for Lissa Weimelt and Bill Pugh, whose daughter Maria was murdered less than three weeks ago. They adopted Maria as a baby from Mexico and raised her in Minnesota. Both Bill and I thought we just won the parenting jackpot. Always smiling. She's Listen, snowmobiled. I gotta she say this. I ain't never my whole life been afraid of the dog. No, I'm, I'm serious. I've never been afraid of the dog. As a kid, I was the kid that would hang outside in the country at night Walking up and down the highway, never was afraid of the dark until I got to be 18 years old and that darkness started to look back at me. Now, stop. If you're looking for a dog man encounter, I'm not sure if this thing was dog man or not. I'm just not. I've heard people say they have glowing eyes and glowing yellow eyes, and but I'm not sure if this was dog man. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you that this was dog man. All I'm going to tell you is this that I'm now afraid of the dark. That's how terrifying this was. But before I go into my story, let me rewind a little bit, go back to my childhood and tell you this. Now, the reason why I used to be outside at night all the time is because my mom and dad would fight. They would get drunk and they would always fight. Why they had to fight each other, I don't know. Some parents get drunk and they do other things, but nope, not my two parents. My mom would start off getting drunk. Next thing she's throwing pots and dishes at my dad. Next thing he's trying to beat her up. And I get to the point where I'm just like, I don't want to be around this. So I head outside in the night, in the dark. And it felt safer being outside in that night, in that darkness, hidden away from what was going on in that house. Now, have I heard things at night in the dark, in the woods? Yeah, I've heard spooky noises. I've seen a few orbs moving around. But for me, I was weighing the scales of being in the household full of violence versus just being outside in the woods at night. And the only time you wouldn't find me out in the dark in the woods was when it was extremely cold. I just couldn't do it. I'm not the type of, even as a kid, I wasn't the type of person that dealt well with cold weather. Now, fast forward, this is what went down. My mom and dad had been going at it for years. My dad finally got a little bit of karma coming his way and he had a stroke. So now my dad is a shell of the man that he used to be. But my mother is still the same woman and she's agitated and aggravated with him because now she has to take care of this man who her entire life that she's been fighting with. And it's crazy because their dysfunctional relationship was insane. It was like now she was upset because he couldn't fight with her. But back then she would be upset that he was fighting with her. I, to this day, I don't understand 
the craziness that was going on in their two heads. But nonetheless, my dad is sitting there, not completely helpless, but he's a shell of the man that he used to be. And she starts screaming at him. And I'm like, mom, listen, relax, chill, whatever you need done, I'll take care of it for you. She curses me out and tells me, F you, your dad should take care of this. And I'm telling her, listen, he cannot do it. He can't physically do it. This leads to her wanting to physically fight with me. And right there in that moment is when I realized this was about to be another cycle where instead of fist fighting and throwing stuff at my dad, she was about to do it with me. So I decide I'm going to escape. I'm not fighting my mother. I'm not laying hands on my mother. I'm not throwing. I don't care what kind of validation she needed. I wasn't doing that. So I leave the house. Boom, I'm gone. Out the door, walking up the roadway. Now, if you outside of our house, there's a street light probably about 30 yards away from the house, right on the street. And then once you get out into the street and you get past that light, there's no other light for a couple of hundred yards. So I go past that street light and I'm just walking. I'm steaming, fuming, saying to myself, why in the hell would my mother want to fight me? To me, it was the most insane thing on the planet. What type of mother wants to fight her son? And as I'm walking along, getting further and further away from that light, the darkness seems different. I don't know how to explain this to you, but there's darkness, right? And then there's this other darkness. It was like the darkness that I was used to seeing, that my eyes would quickly adjust to. It was like there was another layer of darkness over it. Not fog, no, not fog. I don't mean regular fog. I mean like another layer of darkness. And again, I want to remind you, I've been doing this since I was a child. My eyes adjust to the darkness extremely quickly. Like I can see things at night in the dark that most people will never see. But this night, it was almost as if there was another layer of darkness over the darkness. This pitch blackness that emerged. Now, I call it emerging silence because it's like it emerges, like it comes towards you, pushing all of the sound away. And the next thing I know, I feel like I'm in this cocoon of darkness and no sound. Like it's enveloping me, like it's surrounding me, like I'm being wrapped in a blanket of darkness, no sound. And that's when I start to see those glowing eyes. The first set of eyes, 14 feet up in the air, glowing yellow eyes. Second set of eyes, about five feet on the ground, glowing yellow eyes. Next thing I know, on both sides of the road, I'm surrounded by these glowing, self-illuminating yellow eyes. I want to be clear with you. I don't have a flashlight. I'm not shining a light. These things are glowing on their own, but there's no sound. The eyes are moving left to right, up and down, but there's no sound of branches, leaves, nothing. The most terrifying thing I've ever experienced. So now imagine a scene. I'm standing there in the middle of the road and I can feel this terror, this fear, unlike anything I've ever felt before. And it's like it's closing in on me, squeezing down like a vice grip. Now listen to me. I don't know if this was God himself that interceded on my behalf, but I felt like I was about to die. I'm standing there in the middle of the road and I see headlights from a vehicle coming. And the craziest thing is the lights from the headlights are struggling to penetrate this darkness. But I see them coming and it's almost like they are pushing through this darkness. And the next thing I hear is that person slamming on the brakes, pressing the horn, and sliding to a stop inches before hitting me. He rolls down the window, sticks his head out and says, why in the hell are you standing in the middle of the road at night? Now listen, I don't know if it was the look on my face or if he looked around and saw what was going on. I can't tell you what it was. But he looks at me and he says, son, you're going to need to get in this truck. Get in the truck, son. Get in the truck. And so I walk around and get in the passenger side of his vehicle and we pull out of there. Now here's the craziest part. As we're driving, that darkness is still there. It's almost like this darkness is following us because you can see the headlights struggling, bouncing off that darkness like they do when you ride in fog. And he says, son, I've never seen anything like this. It's like this darkness won't go away. And so he speeds up more and we finally break through it and everything goes normal. 20 minutes later, he drops me off at home and my mom is still pissed off, still wants to fight. So I just go out in the backyard and sit down. I'm not fighting my mother. That'll never happen.
Do things seem off? Trouble sleeping? Issues in your marriage, finances, or with extended family and friends? These are challenges that many men face, but you don't have to face them alone. The Men of Steel Prayer Group is here for you. We are a fellowship of individuals who share a common interest in the paranormal and cryptid fields, united in our quest for understanding the supernatural. Our goal is to educate and guide those curious or seeking insight into the supernatural, emphasizing the role of Jesus Christ as the supreme authority over the supernatural realm. Visit us at strongmenpraying.com to learn more. The Men of Steel Prayer Group, where faith and curiosity forge a stronger spirit. Listen, guys, I'm back with another set of stories for you. This set of stories, I combined them to make it a little bit longer. Algorithm-wise, it doesn't really put it out there unless it's 10 to 15 minutes long. And it's different. It affects the algorithm differently. But we have a dog man encounter and a little people story. Now, to me, the little people story that happened in uh, Covington, Louisiana, is amazing. It's crazy. We're talking about them finding a burial mound on the back end of a person's private property right by the Trafalta River and deciding that they're going to push this mound over and these little people come out of the mound and jump into the river. Now, you can look it up, the Trafalta River. There's a whole bunch of neighborhoods that are right along the edge of the Trafalta River. But they come out, jump into the river. And in the story, it seems like it's weeks, but it's really months that pass before they have their first fundraiser. And then during that fundraiser, People are attacked by what I only can believe is these little people. And you know that in Native American traditions, the little people are considered to be mischievous and crazy and do little evil, wicked things to get back at people. And it just makes perfect sense. That's what this was. I want to get your opinion on it. The other one is a dog man encounter. And in my opinion, this is not flesh and blood dog man. This is something demonic. The guy wasn't hallucinating. He's not crazy. Spent a significant amount of time talking to him, so he's not out of his mind. He went through a terrible time. And again, it just goes to show you that there are certain conditions under which people encounter these cryptids. And those conditions tend to be you are in a bad state financially, emotionally, physically. There's something going on with you when you start to encounter these things. And I just want you guys to be mindful that if you find yourself encountering these things, that it may be a good Time to do a spiritual checkup. You know what I'm saying? Get your behind back in church. Do something for yourself. As opposed to just being fascinated with, oh, I saw a dog man. Let me find out who else has seen one. Who else has seen a dog man? Oh, by the way, look at my, my YouTube plaque back there. Hello, YouTube plaque. Get yourself a spiritual checkup. You know what I'm saying? It's if you got a cough and a runny nose, you go to the doctor because you might have the flu. Got a toothache and got pain in your mouth. Hey, man, you need to go see a dentist. And this is really what it boils down to. You're just experiencing symptoms, something larger and greater. So with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you all enjoy the show. Peace out. Peace. Do things seem off? Trouble sleeping? Issues in your marriage, finances, or with extended family and friends? These are challenges that many men face, but you don't have to face them alone. The Men of Steel Prayer Group is here for you. We are a fellowship of individuals who share a common interest in the paranormal and cryptid fields, united in our quest for understanding the supernatural. Our goal is to educate and guide those curious or seeking insight into the supernatural, emphasizing the role of Jesus Christ as the supreme authority over the supernatural realm. Visit us at strongmenpraying.com to learn more. The Men of Steel Prayer Group where faith and curiosity forge a stronger spirit. So I took this job for Brightside Landscaping Development. Phenomenal job. When I tell you coming from the job that I was in before and moving to this one, it was like moving from hell into heaven. Things were fantastic. I loved it. I mean, I really, really did. But then things kind of got a little bit crazy. Now, I know the story I'm about to tell you is short, 
And in your mind, you probably gonna be like, this dude is retarded, but I'm not. I promise you, this is what happened. We get this job in Covington, Louisiana by the Trafuncta River. The people wanted to redo their entire backyard, redo the front landscaping, and make their space more for entertaining people. The family wanted to touch up their front lawn and completely renovate their backyard because they had plans on entertaining people and doing fundraisers. So we go through the preliminaries, drafting up the plans, coming to agreement, going through the quoting process. They make their deposit and wham, we get to work. Now, listen to me. I don't know who owned this land before them or where it was from. But if you go on the very, very far side of their property, they have a dock where they park their boats. To the left of their dock was this mound of dirt and grass. It had to be 10 feet long, maybe six feet high. I'm back there with the bulldozer operator. I tell him we're going to level this off, extend the dock out. I'm going through all the plans. Now, listen to this crazy shit. He angles that bulldozer, hits that mound. The dirt starts rolling off of it. Some of it's falling into the river. And I'm telling him go a little bit slower. When I start to see these little bitty hands reaching up through the dirt, they kind of look like baby's hands reaching out of the dirt, but the fingers are freaking moving. And at first I'm saying to myself, Rod, you got to be hallucinating. This can't be real. He keeps pushing the dirt and more and more hands come out of the dirt. And so I'm like, wait, stop, hold on, hold up, stop. You need to come see this. So he hops out of the bulldozer, runs up onto the dirt, and he sees these hands now trying to dig themselves out of the dirt. The two of us stand there and observe the most wildest scene I have ever witnessed in my life. These five little bitty people dig themselves out of this mound of dirt, look around, look at us, and start speaking in another language like they're cursing us out. That's the feeling I got like they were pissed. And then dive into the river and go under the water. Did you hear what I said to you? Dive in the river and go under the water. Now, I don't know if you've ever experienced anything so freaky or so weird that it threw you off for the rest of the day. That threw me off and I shut the job site down. I said, nope, we're done for the day. I go inside. I tell the homeowner I experienced something on the backside of your property. I'm going to take a day off. They ask me what I saw. I try to explain it to them and they act like I'm crazy. Get this. The following day, we come back to the job site, me and my whole crew. We go ahead and push that dirt. My guy uses the dozer to level the land out, and the homeowner's wife comes out. And she says, well, my husband doesn't believe in the supernatural and the paranormal. But I told him the reason why we should not be messing with this backyard is because the little people live back there. And she goes on to explain to me that she believed the mound that was back there was a home for little people. Now, I don't know nothing about no damn little people. Never heard of them. Never dealt with them. But she goes on to tell me that there's a curse for anybody who messes with the homes of the little people. Now, fast forward about two and a half months. We completely redone that yard. It's amazing. They're having a fundraiser. The dock is extended. Things are beautiful. We're all there talking. They're having a fundraiser. Everybody's out there. Things are beautiful. They have the microphone set up on the dock. And they start to acknowledge our company for the renovation work that we did and how we did a beautiful job. They call my boss, the company owner, to the dock to do a little speech. And he's standing there talking when something, I mean something invisible, literally pushes him off the dock into the water. Listen, he's standing there holding the microphone. And it looks like Ray Lewis runs into him and tackles him. His body goes flying into the water. Now, the wife of the homeowner is there trying to help him out of the water, and something flips her into the water. And I need you to understand something. This is the Trafuncta River, a flowing river. Alligators, all kinds of stuff in there. These people are starting to float down river. Now, all hell breaks loose as people are scrambling, trying to get them out of the water. Now, get this. Each and every person that tried to help them and got close to the water's edge, they went flipping into the water. I'm observing this and watching this saying, oh, hell no, I ain't got nothing to do with this. I ain't got nothing to do with this.
All right, I want to start my story off by saying this to you. And I want to be clear. For a little while while this was going on, I thought I was losing my mind. Let me give you the background of what I was going through. See, I've been working for FedEx for 15 years. And during that process, I've had my ups and downs. I've had routes changed. I've had new bosses come in. I've had coworkers get murdered. But around the time period where this was going on, I was dealing with problems with my family. My wife and I were struggling, and I was under the impression that she was cheating on me. Why? Because she gave me every indication that she was. Sitting in a car when she came home for work for hours in the driveway. Going out on weekends with her quote-unquote girlfriend. And I need you to understand something. As a man, all I did was provide for my family. I didn't go out. I didn't hang out, didn't drink, didn't smoke, didn't do drugs. In my mind, I did everything that a man is supposed to do. And it's a funny thing when you find yourself in a situation like that. Your mind starts to race. You know, because in many ways, your mind is like its own city. You know, you have places in your mind that you drive through and it's beautiful houses, you know, beautiful decorations, cut lawns. It's amazing. Then there's these areas in your mind, the dark areas, where you turn down the street and the street lights are broken. The windows are shattered, and it's a bad neighborhood. Well, I found myself in this time period visiting that bad neighborhood in my mind quite often. Imagine the scene, I'm driving my route, and there's a thing you need to know about being a driver. You see, you can drive a vehicle, but not be consciously driving a vehicle. You can kind of just be going through the routines. You're paying attention, but you're completely somewhere else in your mind. Now, if you're not used to doing this, it's extremely dangerous. But for a person like me who does it all the time, Hey man, I could be driving my FedEx truck, but I am not in that truck. I'm somewhere in my mind trying to figure out and solve a problem. And that's where I was the very first time that I saw one of these dog men jump across the road. Now, I'm not sure if you call them puppies or whatever you call them, but this thing was smaller than what everybody described. It was about the size of two car tires. It runs out from the trees down into the ditch and jumps in one leap across the road, lands down in the ditch and goes off into the woods. However, remember, like I was trying to explain to you at that moment in time, I was in a bad neighborhood in my mind. So I didn't really believe that I saw what I saw. If that makes any sense to you. Like I saw it, yes. But I'm thinking, okay, man, you your mind is all over the place. You're hallucinating. So I just keep on driving, going on about my business, do my route, head home, and start to deal with the problems at home. Now, at home over time, the situation seemed like it was getting better. She chilled out with sitting in a car when she came home. She was staying in the house a lot more often. She wasn't going out with her girlfriends every weekend. And over time, I thought things were getting better. I really, really did. Then it all went down. I mean, the truth comes falling from the sky like somebody jumping off for the World Trade Center. Because I decided for once, I'm going to hang out with my co-workers after work. Something that I absolutely did not do. And to be honest with you, I paid a price for being non-social on the job. There were plenty of guys who came into this job and were extremely social and they prospered. I mean, they hung out with everybody, got to be friends with everybody. Next thing you knew, they were managers. Me, my whole life was sitting around taking care of family, so I didn't do those things. Job was secondary to family. Nonetheless, all of us go out to Top Golf. We're hitting golf balls, having drinks, hanging out, having fun. And our stall is the furthest one to the left hand side, which allows you to see over the parking lot. Now, that Top Golf shared the parking lot with Cheesecake Factory and all the rest of these restaurants. So I'm there with my friends, having beers, drinking, laughing, joking, and something tells me to look out into the parking lot. When I look out into that parking lot, I see my wife getting out of the car with another man, hugging and kissing and going into the Cheesecake Factory. From now, I'm standing there in total shock. But luckily, I mean luckily, nobody at this job had ever met my wife. So they didn't know that my wife was out in public with another man cheating on me. So I quickly excuse myself and head downstairs out the building so i quickly excuse myself head downstairs drive my vehicle over and park as close as i can to where they are parked and i sit there one hour passes two hours pass three hours pass my co-workers are calling me telling me that they're headed home and i'm letting them know now nah, i'm good i had to go make a stop and check on something i'll catch you guys later finally the two of them come walking out holding hands so i crank the car pull up right next to them driver's side window roll down and I look at it, and I say, now all of this work that I've been doing to provide for you and my family, and this is what you out here in these streets doing? And you know the worst thing about it? There was not a look of remorse on her face whatsoever. She just looks at me, 
and tells me that I can pick up the kids from by her sister and that she won't be coming home. So now I head to her sister's house, pick up the kids, go home, and I'm just sitting there in shock. And I know you're saying to yourself, now why would you be telling me all of this? Because I'm going to tell you what I saw the following day. And I'm going to tell you, I truly believe when Dark Water says you have these encounters based on the status and situations that's going on in your life, man, I'm telling you, I had some horrific crap going on in my life when I had my encounter. And I think what he's saying is the truth. The following morning, I get up, take the kids to school, go to work. Now I'm off on my route. And when I tell you I'm in the bad neighborhood, in my mind, I'm in the bad neighborhood. And in this neighborhood, what no churches around in this neighborhood of my mind. It was the bad neighborhood. I'm thinking about doing all kinds of wicked and evil stuff to my wife, how she embarrassed me, how she doesn't care, how she took for granted the sacrifices that I made for her. I'm losing it. I'm on a two lane highway. Woods on the right hand side, woods on the left hand side. And when I tell you, it looks like one of these things emerges from the ground in the ditch, pitch black, like it shot straight up out of the ground and it jumps into the street and stands there as I'm coming towards it. Like it's daring me to have a head on head collision with it. And we're talking about broad daylight. This thing is jet black, blacker than any black that you've ever seen. But it looks like a wolf standing on two legs. Now, remember, I told you I was in a bad place mentally. Honestly, I was suicidal at the moment. I didn't give a fuck. So I punch it, hit the gas, and I say, if you want to die, we're going to die together. And as I'm speeding towards this thing, it vanishes back into the ground. Like it just popped out of a portal and went right back in. The strangest, damnedest, most craziest thing that I've ever seen. It was three weeks later that I finally reached out to Dark Waters and told him about this story. And that's when he started sharing other encounters that people had exactly like this, where they just popped up out of nowhere. And he said they weren't flesh and blood. He said these things were demonic. I don't know how many of you listening to the story grew up as latchkey kids. And if you don't know what a latchkey kid is, that means you grew up in a single parent household and you had a key to the house at a young age, meaning you would come home and spend hours. I'm talking about hours alone all by yourself until your mother or your father came home. Well, that's how I grew up. I was a latchkey kid. My mother would put me on a bus to school in the morning And then in the evening time, when I came home, I had to go into the house by myself. And she didn't get home until 8.30 at night. And I was getting home from school at 2.30, 2.45. One of the mass effects of being a latchkey kid is you feel abandoned. Quite frankly, as a young kid, I felt abandoned. But also at the same time, it makes you fiercely independent. However, those two things are something that's very hard to balance in life that independence and that pride of being able to do things all on your own versus that need for attention and love that wasn't there. Then when you combine in the fact that as a latchkey kid, you come home 
and find your back door kicked in, your house ransacked, and everything spewed around, now you add in fear. And I remember those days, being 11 years old, after someone broke into our house and having to come home every day wondering if they were coming back. Now, if you take that fear that I'm talking about right now and you just think about it and focus on it for a second and then you multiply that same fear by 1,000, that was the fear that I had when I had my dog man encounter. Understand, I was a latchkey kid all the way through high school. It's my junior year in high school. And when I tell you I was fiercely independent, man, at that point in time, I was super independent. I had my own job. I had my set of friends. I had bought my own little raggedy car. I was riding around doing whatever I needed to do. But I still was coming home to an empty house. And in my mind, I was telling myself, it's okay that you come home to an empty house. You don't need anyone to protect you. You can protect yourself. Well, that all came crashing down. One evening, when I came home after dark, tried to put the key in the front door, and my mother had never changed the lock, and it wouldn't unlock. So I had to circle around the back side of the house and going through the back door. And let me tell you something. I never was afraid of the woods, and our neighborhood wasn't exactly rural. My closest neighbor's house was at a distance where you could see it, but I definitely, absolutely couldn't just scream and they come running and help me. So now, imagine a scene, circling around the side of the house, and I get to the back door. The back porch light is not on because there was no reason for it to ever be on because nobody ever used the back porch. So I'm standing there in the darkness, putting the key in, unlocking the door when I hear this growl coming from behind the shed. Now, to tell you where the shed is, it's to my right, about 15 feet. I remember it as clear as day. It was one of those white, Ten sheds. And I hear this growling sound so loud that tin begins to shake and vibrate. However, looking in that direction, it's pitch black, pure darkness. Can't see anything. Then this darkness inside of that darkness emerges and it's taller than the shed itself. And it's moving around. Now pause right here and let me say this to you that time I did not see the dog man I saw the silhouette I hurry into the house lock the door click on the back lights go look out the kitchen window and there's nothing there but that time I became afraid and there's something about fear I mean fear itself being in fear that I believe made me to continue to have these encounters part of me feels like had I just ignored it like it never happened I would have been all right but I couldn't Man, I heard that. I heard that tin shaking, and it scared me to my core. A couple of days later, I make a point of changing the front lock myself, giving my mother another key and me taking another key. Everything is cool. I'm coming and going as usual. No freaking problem. Then it's a Saturday night, and I remember the Saturday night because my mom wanted me to spend it at home with her, but my girlfriend wanted to go out to the movies. And I remember the argument my mother and I had her saying, son, I never get a chance to spend time with you. I want us to stay inside and watch a movie tonight. And I remember the disappointment on her face when I told her, no, you've had ample opportunity to spend time with me, but you decided that you were going to work. I remember how those words pierced her soul like a knife, the tears in her eyes, walking out of the door, getting into the car and feeling bad about it, but pushing that feeling down. Have you ever experienced that where you said something that you knew hurt somebody? I mean, really, you should have been sorry, but your pride rose up and you said, nah, I'm not about to feel bad about it. I remember pushing it down in my mind, pushing it down in my soul, like whatever, I'm gonna do what I wanna do. Well, I go out with my girlfriend, we go to the movies, things are fine, we make out in the movies, I have a blast. Come home and all the lights are off outside. No porch lights, no floodlights, no nothing. I pull up in that driveway to the right by the trees. I see that darkness again that's darker than the darkness. And I hear it growling. And then I hear it coming my way. And in that moment, I froze. I'm not going to lie to you. Imagine a scene. I'm standing outside of the car. You know how you go through the motion of closing your car door as you're walking away? 
Well, that's the motion. I was pushing that door closed. I hear the growl and now I'm frozen and I have to make a decision. Do I go inside of the house or do I get in the car and leave? And I knew for a fact what that growl was because I heard it before and it was very, very distinctive, unlike anything you will ever hear when you hear a dog man growl. In that split second, I make a decision to get back in the car, crank it up, turn the high beams on and back out of there. And as I'm backing out of the driveway, this thing is illuminated in the lights. Now I'll say this to you, there have been eyewitnesses who describe dog man as looking like a hyena. And what I saw looked like a freaking gigantic hyena. Neck, shoulders, arms. I mean, it looked like a hyena, even had the same color scheme as a hyena. But this thing looked vicious. Like its job was to get me. Like it was sent to kill and eat me. Now, this might be the fear and adrenaline kicking in, but in that moment, I felt like it was looking through the high beams and into the windshield directly at me. I remember it taking its hand and putting it on the top of its head and swiping down its snout like it was wiping its face and then dropping down on all fours and coming in my direction. Get this, I end up backing up, going down the street for about 50 yards, full speed, backing up down the road, hitting the brakes, turning the wheels, spinning, shifting in the drive, and taking off getting out of there. Let me say this, you may be thinking to yourself the same thing that eventually came to my mind as I was driving away. Because after driving up that roadway for about three to four minutes, it dawned on me, hold up, hold on a second, man. My mama is in that house. The lights were all off. Is my mama? And it was right then and there in that moment that I was hit across the head with regret. You know, in the cartoons where Wile E. Coyote would get hit by an anvil that fell out of the sky, that's what it felt like. I got hit upside the head with regret. Like you should have never left your mother in that house all alone. So I turned that car around in the middle of the road, accelerating as fast as I can, deciding that I don't give a damn if this thing is out there, I'm going to roll over it. But I'm getting inside of that house to check on my mother. Now, as I'm coming towards the house, I cut off the road, come across the yard, and slam on my brakes, sliding to a halt right in front of the front porch. Hop out, go in, turn the key, and now I'm screaming, Mama, are you okay, Mama? Are you in the house? Mama, are you all right? And the craziest thing is, my mother is standing there in the kitchen eating soup and crackers. Now, let me tell you something. I didn't see this creature again after that. And I know it sounds weird and strange, but I'm telling you, part of me feels like it was that level of disrespect to my mother that made this happen. Do things seem off? Trouble sleeping? Issues in your marriage, finances, or with extended family and friends? These are challenges that many men face, but you don't have to face them alone. The Men of Steel Prayer Group is here for you. We are a fellowship of individuals who share a common interest in the paranormal and cryptid fields, united in our quest for understanding the supernatural. Our goal is to educate and guide those curious or seeking insight into the supernatural emphasizing the role of Jesus Christ as the supreme authority over the supernatural realm. Visit us at strongmenpraying.com to learn more. The Men of Steel Prayer Group, where faith and curiosity forge a stronger spirit. Hey man, listen to me on this encounter. I want to share something with you guys. Um, I don't normally do dream encounters. You're going to find out that I'm doing more dream encounters, but the reason why I'm doing them is because I want to educate people on the dream realm. Um, so you understand there are multiple different realms that we live in. And the dream realm is a real realm with real consequences. Uh, from a biblical perspective, um, the Pharaoh in the Bible found out about the famine that was coming on the land in a dream, had the dream interpreted. Uh, also, King Solomon became the wealthiest man on the planet in a dream. So there's something about dreams that um, 
most people don't truly understand. Now, many of you guys have vivid dreams where uh, they're hyper-realistic, and that's cool, but also you make spiritual exchanges in dreams, and if you're not aware of it, you could be in the dream realm, excuse me, and making an exchange that you don't know that you're doing. Um, there's people who will astral project and come into people's dreams and try and hurt and harm them in their dreams. Um, so the dream realm is a real realm that you need to be mindful of. It's a place of power. It's a place where curses and blessings take place. Um, and we'll be talking about that a little bit, bit more in the future. Not at this very moment, but I wanted to release this dog man encounter um, as a precursor to what's coming down the pipeline. Hopefully everybody's doing well today and you guys are really enjoying your day. I'm having a phenomenal day. Um, things are going awesome for me. And I'll see you guys in a couple hours. We're going to be talking about giants in a minute. I don't know. I might do this this evening. We'll be talking about giants because I really want to talk to you guys about this footage that came out of Thailand. Yeah, it was Thailand where um, there's a giant on top of a mountain and this boy is big. This is one of the ones that where they found uh, from aerial views where it looks like a human body laying down. This is one of those type of giants. And it's it's in, it's indicative of a lot of things that on YouTube, everybody's just highlighting it for views, but nobody's really talking about what it means. Um, you got Steve Quell, who's been around a long time explaining these things, but it's a lot more than just what Steve Quell has talked about. So... Nonetheless, we're going to keep digging into Giants. Uh, you'll be seeing me talk about that footage in a little while. I hope everybody's doing well. Um, look at my baby mama, Sade, back there in the background. Hey, Sade. What's up, girl? I love you, girl. All right, peace out. Do things seem off? Trouble sleeping? Issues in your marriage, finances, or with extended family and friends? These are challenges that many men face, but you don't have to face them alone. The Men of Steel Prayer Group is here for you. We are a fellowship of individuals who share a common interest in the paranormal and cryptid fields, united in our quest for understanding the supernatural. Our goal is to educate and guide those curious or seeking insight into the supernatural, emphasizing the role of Jesus Christ as the supreme authority over the supernatural realm. Visit us at strongmenpraying.com to learn more. The Men of Steel Prayer Group where faith and curiosity forge a stronger spirit. I mean, going back to when I was a kid, I would have the most vivid, realistic dreams that anybody probably has had. Sometimes I'm surfing on the ocean and a giant shark comes and swallows me up. Other times I'm flying through the air with giant eagles. The dream world was a place where I felt comfortable. I mean, really felt comfortable. I look forward to going to sleep at night. That was until I started seeing Dogman in my dreams. Now, let me say this to you. I don't profess to be a clairvoyant. I don't profess to be a person whose dreams come true. But over my lifespan, I've had dreams that have come true. Simple, small stuff like seeing a person in a restaurant or bumping into a woman at a gas station. Things like that. But when I started having these dreams about dog, man, it frightened me so much that I was afraid to go to sleep. Let me give you one example. I lay in the bed, get comfortable go to sleep and all of a sudden I'm in this family's living room they're sitting around the table having dinner and this family wasn't in the United States they were clearly Middle Eastern in some way shape or form but they're having dinner around their dining room table and something starts to bang on the front door the loudest banging I've ever heard but the family is not noticing the banging but the family can't hear the banging I'm the only one that can hear it Seconds later, this thing comes barging through their door and tears them to shreds and just looks at me. The most terrifying thing I've ever seen. 
I wake up in a cold sweat. A few days after that, I have another dream. I'm riding a bicycle. I'm going downhill. It's the most beautiful scenery I've ever seen. The road that I'm on snakes down the side of this mountain. It has these sharp curves and I'm navigating the curves trying to make sure I don't go off of the mountain. When I hear this growling behind me, looking back and up from where I started, it's a dog man. And instead of following the roadway down, it's leaping over the side of the mountain, landing on the roadway and constantly leaping, coming in my direction. I remember pedaling that bike as fast as I could, but nothing, I mean, nothing I could do allowed me to get away from this thing. And finally, it takes one more leap and knocks me off of the bike and I wake up. The dreams got worse and worse. And to be clear with you, I don't live anywhere in the country. There's no reason for me to be dreaming about Dogman. There's no reason for Dogman to be anywhere near me. Then one Saturday night, my friends want to hang out. We go to this local bar room. It's right across the street from a park. And the way this bar room was set up, they had overflow seating. So they had taken parking spaces, which were on the side of the street and set up tables and put like this little barrier around it. It was only four tables out there. It was only four tables could seat 16 people. It's me and my three friends sitting there having a blast. I mean, a phenomenal time. When something draws my attention to the park across the street. Now, if you ever been to any big city, you've seen a park. Well, this park is like any other park. You look over there, there's lights on. It's not particularly dark at all. In fact, I was able to see someone walking back there. About an hour passes of us sitting, drinking, talking, laughing, cracking jokes. Some more people come around and now we're kind of standing up in that little table area, just having conversations. When I look over at the park and the lights start to shut off, the light furthers away turns off first then the next one then the next one then the next one and now i'm looking at pitch black darkness and just so you understand i wasn't the only one that noticed this another friend of mine says man what happened to the lights in the park but he just says it in passing and goes on with his conversation now i'm standing there looking into this darkness and that's when i see these glowing eyes low to the ground like something is crawling in our direction pause right here let me say this i was not dreaming i was not drunk i was wide awake and i was witnessing this with my own two eyes and as this thing with these glowing eyes is low to the ground coming in my direction i flash back to one of the dreams that i forgot kind of like a deja vu moment and in that dream my friends and i were in the exact same place hanging out chilling relaxing except for the lights didn't go out in the park when it was time for me to go home i cut through that very same park and that dog man attacked me with those same eyes. And so now I'm standing there realizing that I've seen some of this in a dream, except for this is full on reality. And there is something over there. Imagine the scene. I'm standing there in a crowd of people freaking out, afraid out of my mind. And it's almost as if nobody else can see this but me. There was a girl that hung out with us at that time named Rainy. So I say, Rainy, look over there and tell me what you see. She looks over and she says the lights are out in the park. I say, you don't see anything else? Maybe somebody's walking around with a flashlight. It just breezes, passes like it's nothing. For the next hour, I stand there too afraid to even freaking move. And I don't know if you've ever been in a situation like that where you're surrounded by people, but you feel alone and you're absolutely terrified. That's how it was for the next hour. Then all of a sudden, the lights come back on. And there's nothing there. To this day, I can't explain it. I don't know what it was. I don't know why it happened. But I know that same night when I went home and went to sleep, I had the most horrific dog man dream I've ever had. It tracked me down, ripped my arm off and ripped my leg off and made me watch it as it devoured my body. Now, listen to me when I say this. I'm not saying that this was some kind of flesh and blood dog man encounter or if it was some ethereal encounter. I don't know what the hell it was. All I know is... In that dream, when it was ripping my arm off and ripping my leg off, it hurt. It physically hurt my body for days. So I don't know what it is. And that's why I'm sharing this story with you.
Have you ever found yourself in a situation in life where you were just trying to move past something? Well, that's where I was when I had this encounter. I was trying to move past this relationship. And it was complicated. I, I mean, this was a love triangle that I never intended to put myself into. You see, a woman who was like a mother to me, her actual son, her blood son used to be engaged to the woman that I had at that time as a girlfriend. Now, to be clear with you, I had no clue that any of these people knew each other. So imagine the scene when the holiday season rolls around and it's time for Christmas and I'm excited, man. I'm absolutely over the moon excited. Pretty much my adopted mother to my girlfriend. Listen, I'm having a Christmas party at my house, spent the entire day decorating and getting things together. 50 people are coming over to the house. The party starts off without a hitch. Nothing goes wrong. About 8.45, I get a text message from my mom. And by mom, I do mean adopted mom, like a woman who just took you in like a son, saying that they're on their way. Understand, I get even more excited. A few minutes later, the doorbell rings. I open up the door and it's her and her son. They come inside, everything is cool. My girlfriend is off in the kitchen. Initially, everything is cool. I go back to the kitchen to talk to my girlfriend. About five minutes later, I notice this look on her face. I'm talking to the men listening to the story right now. Now, you know when something's wrong with your woman. I mean, like you can look at her physically and tell when something's wrong. She doesn't even have to say a word out of her mouth, but you can look at her eyes, look at her face, look at her body position and know that something's wrong. That's where I find myself. I'm standing in the kitchen, looking at my woman, realizing that there's something wrong. She's staring past me. And so my eyes follow her gaze and it leads over to Grant. Pause right here and let me say this. Grant is my adopted mother's son. She's staring at Grant. Grant is staring at her. And it's this look on her face. The look on her face is a look of surprise. The look on his face is this look of anger and disgust. Listen, at this moment in time, I don't know what type of history the two of them had. But in that moment, I know they had some type of history. Because he makes a beeline. I'm talking about walking extremely aggressive, bumping into people. Now, I'm seeing this and I'm saying to myself, oh, hold up, little daddy. You're not going to be walking around up in here. Like you own this place. Sure enough, as soon as he crosses the threshold to the kitchen, he starts to say to my girlfriend, what are you doing here? I thought I told you I didn't want to see you again. Ladies, I, now pause again. Ladies, you can verify this for me. You see, depending on how a man treated you is how you react to that man. I never seen fear in my woman's eyes because I never put her in a state of fear. But all of a sudden, I'm watching this fear roll across her face because Grant is talking to her, and I ain't gonna lie to you, as my brain is processing all of this, I'm not liking what I'm seeing because he's talking real aggressive. So I said, hold on, brother. Grant, how you doing? Let me introduce you to my girlfriend. And he looks at me and says, she's your girlfriend? And I said, yes, in fact, she lives in this house with me. Now remember, I described the look of anger and disgust on his face. That starts to triple at this point in time. Now he's really angry and really disgusting. He proceeds to fire off this, and he proceeds to fire off this volley of curse words and insults towards my woman. F you, you boop, 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 boop. And as these words are leaving his mouth, I'm physically watching her reaction to it, coming to the realization that not only were they in a relationship, but they were in a relationship where he did this regularly. And it brought back to my memory what she told me about her ex. She just said that he was muscular and that he was verbally abusive and borderline physically abusive. Now, I hope you're keeping up with me in the story. And I know you're saying to yourself, man, what the hell all of this got to do with the dog man or the Bigfoot? Just hold on a second. I'm telling you about me. And I need you to understand what I was going through. I'm telling you about me. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where time starts to slow down well while all this is happening everything is slowing down i'm looking around the room and people are slowly starting to move in a direction paying attention to this confrontation and my brain starts to process this situation grant's mother is like my adopted mother but if she raised grant to behave this way then that's technically 
her fault that her son is this type of man. So I'm trying to figure out and understand. I'm trying to rationalize how me fucking up Grant. And I'm listening to me. Understand. I'm trying to rationalize how me fucking Grant's ass up is going to affect my relationship with her. And so my brain is going through the process of justifying what I'm about to do. And it didn't take a long time for me to justify it. I just wanted to be justified. And so when I realized that, okay, if she raised him to be this way, then it's her responsibility. Fuck it. I'm finna fuck Grant up. I don't know if you guys ever made skillet corn. It could be fresh corn. It could be count. Now, I'm not sure if you ever made skillet corn. It could be fresh corn that you cut off the cob, or it could be corn that came out of a can. But you cook it in a black skillet. You put some olive oil, you put some butter, you put some salt and some pepper. Right there on the stove was the skillet with the skillet. And as he takes another step towards my girlfriend, I reach over and grab that skillet and whack the shit out of him, bust him dead smack in his mouth. I know a lot of you listen to these stories and not used to blood and gore and violence, but I will say this to you, when human flesh gets hit with an iron skillet, it loses the fight every time. That boy face bust open, somebody dropped the watermelon. Blood gushing everywhere, and now I'm losing it, telling him, get your ass about my house you and your stinking ass mama that's the only thing i felt bad about with this situation i didn't have to insult her because she's done a lot for me now fast forward his mouth is gushing blood his top two front teeth are bent inwards and he's writhing in pain people are trying to tend to him and i'm pulling his ass out of my house blood is dripping all over the floor throw him out the front door his mother goes outside, people are calling the police. It's going down around this bad boy. It done went completely ghetto and it's going down. The ambulance pulls up. Listen, the boy's face just won't stop bleeding. He getting to the point to where he's starting to lose too much blood. They call the ambulance. The ambulance comes out, the police come out. They do the report by the bing, by the boom, the party ends. I don't get arrested because this dude's trying to assault my woman inside of my house. Everybody goes away. It's about 1 a.m. And now it's just me and her. And we're sitting on the sofa talking. And she starts to explain to me more about her relationship with him, her relationship with his mom, and how his mom was a good woman. But she did everything she could do for him. But he was just one of those bad apples. Nothing she said or nothing she did would change him. So now my woman's tired. She goes upstairs, goes to bed. But I still have that adrenaline dump going on. Well, you're just shaky and jittery. Not because I was afraid, but that's just how your body reacts when you get into a fight. Well, I go outside of the house to smoke a cigarette. Standing out on the front porch, smoking my cigarette. The Christmas lights are on the house. And now across the street from my house, it's nothing but woods. I'm talking about pitch black darkness, pure, just wood line. So I'm standing there smoking my cigarette when I see this bright light in the sky. And I'm not talking about like a helicopter light or airplane light. This was just this ball of light and it was descending from the sky. And the lower it got, the bigger it got. Listen to me, I'm talking about light so bright that it's blinding to the eyes. It comes down low over the trees and then it just blacks out, gone. So now I'm standing outside of the house thinking to myself, okay, I just had to whoop this dude's ass. Is this a UFO? What the hell is going on out here? I'm thinking it may have been 13, 14 more minutes that I stayed out there kind of chilling, relaxing before I head inside, go upstairs and prepare to go to bed. Now, once I'm upstairs inside of the house, our bedroom is towards the front of the house and we have a window that faces the front of the house. That front of the house faces the woods, right? So I'm inside the house when the bright light returns. I mean, just this beam of light, like it's shining straight through the window. I look in the bed, my old lady sleep. And so I go back downstairs and go outside looking up in the sky right now is where i'm going to sound like a freaking lunatic and i'm fine with sounding like a lunatic i'm just going to tell you what i saw so that bright light is in the sky it's above the trees it goes up above the trees and it shrinks down to size it goes up above the trees and then it shrinks down in size but then these other balls of white light start to emerge from the trees and by the trees, I mean from the ground where the trees are, they're going up through the trees and into the air. The closest one to me was probably about 45 yards across the road. And I'm watching this bubble of light rise up into the sky and there is a giant wolf inside of this bubble. It looks like 
a giant werewolf inside of this bubble scratching and clawing at this bubble of light to get away. As I scan right to left, there's eight more bubbles going into the air. I can't really see what's in them, but they're humanoid in shape and they're massive bubbles. This goes on. These things slowly rise up into the air to that bigger white bubble and then it all disappears. Woof, just pure darkness. Now, I don't know if that means that cryptids come from UFOs. I don't have no clue what the hell it means. All I'm telling you is this. That's what I saw. And I just wanted somebody to hear about it.